So let me introduce Dr. Hanan Masi to you. So I'm very delighted to introduce her to uh, for our first keynote lecture to speak on transitional finance in Africa. Dr. Masi joins us virtually from the Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, where she, which she's attending currently. Dr. Mossi is the Deputy Executive Secretary and Chief Un Economist of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, ECA in short. Dr. Mossi has a wealth of cross-country experience and vast expertise in leading top quality policy and European work and building strong partnerships, working in international organizations and the private sector. She has published on a wide range of economic and development issues and led a number of flagship, major flagship uh, publications. Prior to joining ECA, Dr. Mossi was the director of the Macroeconomic Policy and Research Dep uh, Department at the African Development Bank between 2018 and 2021, where she provided thought leadership on economic issues and oversaw the production of rigorous analytical work that strengthened the bank's policy dialogue and oper operations across its member countries. And before that, she pre worked previously as associate director and lead economist for the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean region at the European Bank for Reconstruction and and development EBRD in short, in London between 2012 and 2018. In that role, she established and headed the economic analysis and policy advisory services for the new region of operation and country missions and Dell country strategies. Prior to that, uh, Dr. Mossi worked at the International Monetary Fund between 20, 2003 and 2012 in various capacities across different departments, including fiscal affairs, Middle East and Central Asia, European, and monetary capital markets where she led and contributed to work on accentuate assessments, fiscal vulnerability, financial and macro prudential policies. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Anan Mossi to provide the first keynote lecture and she's gonna join us for virtually. Dr. Mossi, over to you. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today uh, and apologies for not being able to be with you in Oslo uh, because I'm participating in Africa Climate Summit. Um, and I think the topic that we're discussing today fits very well with, you know, the number of discussions that we've been having here and a number of uh, African, um, you know, high level uh, summits and um, uh, conferences. Um, we're, um, I will focus today on issues of uh, how to scale up domestic resource mobilization and rethinking uh, approaches to this in Africa. Uh, tax revenue in Africa uh, has remained largely below uh, uh, peers since 2000, since 2000. And you can see in the charts how Africa resource mobilization, uh, you know, have compared relative to South Africa, to Latin America, uh, and uh, basically it has been rather stagnant since early 2000s. And African tax um, uh, uh, revenue, uh, even compared to um, uh, peers by income level, not just by regions, um, have uh, have shown limited uh, progress. Um, and uh, uh, really, it, among the the regions, if we look at among the uh, grouping by income countries, we see that uh, looking, if we look at it, um, rebased by two thousand, it's the only region where actually. Um, uh, it, it has it experienced significant decline compared to 2000 tax revenue levels. Meanwhile, I think the what is um, you know complicating the situation is while we've been seeing a kind of erosion and decline. Uh, um, in the um, re domestic revenue mobilization. Uh, at the same time, the global financing um, scene um, is actually uh, making the situation even more difficult for meeting development needs for Africa, because finance is getting scarier and more costly. Uh, we can see here, as you can see from the borrowing cost and the Africa spread, how it has been rising, and particularly with the number of global shocks that we have seen. So it even um, rose significantly during COVID, and as a result, 
of the war in Ukraine. Um, and there is, uh, um, you know, uh, there has been uh, uh, already identified uh, that there is uh, um, an Africa premium uh, for uh, tapping international capital markets. So usually Africa pays between a hundred to 250 basis points higher relative to countries with similar macroeconomic fundamentals. So that even makes it harder for African countries, um, even with those that have been doing well in terms of macroeconomic fundamentals, to get financing at affordable scale. But this is also going to become even more complicated because we are uh, moving into a, a new financing uh, financial markets norm. Uh, we're not going to see this historically low interest rate that we have witnessed over the last decade and a half. Um, we are now seeing much higher interest rates. And on top of that, if we compound that with the type of spreads that Africa faces and the risk premium, Africa risk premium that um, we witness, this will become even more difficult for countries to either roll over their debt or to finance additional ones. Um, and this is really the, the, um, the financing gap therefore poses a serious challenge going forward. Uh, it's driven by the um, uh, primary deficit, high primary deficit, that is also expected to persist. And um, with the fact that we have uh, currently uh, historically high levels of uh, debt, and with the concessional financing trends that we have been seeing basically declining over the last two decades, um, and Added to this, what we have just uh, uh, shown in terms of external financing becoming more costly and more scarce. This means that, uh, you know, there is no option but really to focus on enhancing and strengthening um, domestic resource mobilization to actually, um, you know, ensure uh, that there is sufficient resources to finance development, uh, SDG uh, investments and climate action. Uh, if we also kind of delve down into composition of the revenues and the trends, we see that uh, uh, it has that the uh, revenues from uh, sales tax and direct taxes uh, have been rather steadily declining, and um, you know also for um, taxes on international trade uh, um, as well. Um, this has been declining and it's likely to even decline further with the number of um, agreements that have, we've seen happening, um, you know, including countries joining the BRICS, but also the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and removal of many of these uh, reduction on these uh, trade taxes across African countries. So that means that really Africa need to focus on enhancing domestic resource mobilization and taxation to be able to um, deliver on the huge needs going forward. Um, in, in this chart, actually, what I tried to do is to look at the, um, you know, dividing African countries according to income level and to see how this, you know, the kind of the taxation um, relative to economic development level. So uh, as we can see that there is a tax mobilization tend to increase with the level of development and uh, which actually helps in expanding tax base. Um, and also, there is a, um, a notable difference in the average of tax mobilization rate by the level of uh, development, as we can see in the chart. But there is also a large even um, dispersion, especially for low-income countries, in terms of uh, revenue mobilization. And really, that has to do with... Uh, the you know weak tax administrations of optimal tax structures and overall for in in Africa the uh, uh, prevalence of uh, informality in the economy, which basically affects the significantly affect the tax base. Um, a very important issue that I think we have not, um, including in research, uh, given sufficient emphasis to is really the link between taxation 
and inequality and using use of taxation to tackle issues of inequality. Uh, as we can see from the chart here, um, improved tax mobilization can actually be an important policy instrument in fighting high and persistent inequality in Africa. And even controlling for differences in per capita consumption levels, country fixed effects and time varying and observed factors, higher tax as a ratio of GDP is associated with uh, a low Gini coefficient in Africa. Uh, this really calls for more um, uh, uh, research at country and regional level to further um, you know, um, uh, study the issue and come up with um, specifics to how can we tackle this. Uh, going to what we started with, with the aim of scaling up tax uh, resource, domestic resource mobilization. So what could be done? I think there are uh, a variety of avenues that uh, need to be really looked into. Um, and some of them I consider as low hanging fruit. Um, and some are really kind of would require um, rethinking of the way that domestic resource mobilizations are done. Um, so let me start by some of which that I think, I believe they are low hanging fruits. And this is the uh, ineffective tax exemptions, which are actually prevalent in Africa. And they account for six to 7% of GDP, resulting in significant revenue losses. Most of these exemptions are related to corporate income tax and value added tax. And they tend to be uh, granted to multinational companies, large corporates, wealthy individuals, and are estimated to cost over $50 billion a year. Uh, among those that actually enjoy or like uh, uh, particularly get tax exemptions uh, are operators in mining sector. 48 African countries offer some form of tax incentive for mining sector. However, I think uh, the tax exemptions, uh, when they are uh, granted with no cross checks, can lead to substantial foregone revenue. Uh, there has been a tendency uh, historically in Africa to kind of compete for attracting, particularly foreign direct investment, through tax incentives. And I think we really need to reconsider that because you know there has been a number of evidence about you know what matters for uh, investor decisions and in many of the surveys in many of the studies it's not really the tax incentives that are provided there are a lot more important incentives and issues that investors would care about for example repatriation if ex, uh, for an ex uh, uh, for an exchange availability and ability to repatriate um, issues of you know availability of energy and lack of you know the the kind of a reliable electricity supply um, uh, you know uh, kind of like uh, macroeconomic and policy certainty so we need to really focus our efforts on what matters and avoid you know um, leakages that don't necessarily bring returns. And that's why I believe that, um, you know, when, it, when, when we have tax exemptions that are granted without proper oversight and evaluation of their impact, this can lead to significant leakages. And um, the lack of transparency also makes it difficult to assess their effectiveness. So it's essential that um, African countries need to evaluate the cost and benefits of these policies and ensure that they contribute to sustainable development. And perhaps, you know, reconsider actually whenever they have not been effective to eliminate them and focus on the key, you know, issues that they are trying to, to, to tackle. So if it's about attracting foreign direct investment, let's focus on what are the key and major obstacles that are holding back FDI. 
The other important um, uh, areas that can also be a potential sources of increasing um, domestic resource mobilization is uh, actually um, includes, for example, um, illicit financial flows, which is an issue that have just been referred to earlier. Um, there are, uh, you know, variety of estimates in terms of how much it costs. Uh, 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 the Economic Commission for Africa, ONICDAT, estimates almost uh, close to 90 billion US dollars a year, which is um, half of the SDG financing gap. So the SDG financing gap uh, is estimated at 200 billion US dollars a year. The illicit financial flows are estimated to be almost to cost half of that financing gap each year. And that's equivalent to 3.7% of Africa's GDP. Also, there has been estimates by AFDB and others uh, to estimate a loss of 1.2 trillion uh, US dollars um, between 1980s and late 2000 due to illicit financial flows. And you can imagine, I mean, we can, if we look at this, we're talking far more than what we're getting in uh, aid, um, you know, a lot more than what it would cost to tackle our, um, you know, uh, health financing gap or education financing gap. So these are massive resources. And in addition, also, we've uh, estimated that um, due to base erosion and profit shifting, that cost Africa 1.8% of GDP a year, around 44 billion US dollars. Uh, so we can see that there are also, there are a number of things that can be done to actually tackle these issues. So, um, for example, you know, significant resources can be achieved by um, uh, really looking into things like you know tax uh, um, uh, expenditures and tax benefits and exemptions. Uh, that in some countries can amount to up to 15% of GDP. So reviewing these type of tax benefits would be essential, but also in addition to that, uh, additional resources of up to 8.5% of GDP could be uh, uh, achieved by mitigating losses due to illicit financial flows and uh, um, a profit shifting. Um, also, uh, African countries uh, have other uh, areas where, which can be uh, promising to, to look at. Um, let me say that these, these are the ones that are not, uh, they, they are important, but they will not be easy. Uh, and these include issues, for example, like uh, land and property taxation. A land and property taxation uh, in Africa, uh, um, revenues from them is less than 1% of GDP, significantly lower than in other regions and averages around the world. Uh, and it's an area that uh, is very important because it relates to issues of, um, you know, it, it, can, it can help in more progressive taxation and it can help also in financing, uh, you know, um, social safety nets. We have uh, even high income and high middle income countries in Africa that have the, the highest inequality ratios. If you think of uh, the, the highest inequality in Africa is in South Africa followed by Namibia. And yet, uh, you know, we don't uh, have um, you know, uh, sufficient revenues that are coming from land and property taxation. So this is uh, an area that would be very important to focus on going forward to help with having more progressive taxation. Of course, around the continent, there are a number of issues that hinder that, from issues of uh, insufficient um, uh, registration uh, records for land and property, to um, you know, capacity constraints in terms of valuation. But I think this is an area that will need to be developed and also has a potential of using uh, technology, whether it's satellite imagery, 
um, whether uh, 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 spatial data that can actually help in uh, you know, enhancing uh, the evaluation uh, in terms of also looking into uh, 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 comparing what is registered and reported relative to uh, what is happening, looking at, uh, you know, the these uh, lands and what it's being used for. Um, so it would be really important to start to do this. Of course, there will be, this is likely to also be an area where there is uh, more uh, more politically sensitive, um, perhaps even uh, you know have issues of uh, vested interest. But I think this is the type of um, you know difficult conversation that have to be had to actually uh, you know progress in terms of finding resources for dealing with uh, you know uh, uh, the needs development needs, but also dealing with the huge needs for improving social safety nets in Africa, and particularly with the tsunami of global shocks that we have seen. Um, we have seen, for example, that in East Asia, the implementation of substantial land taxation uh, has led to decline in land speculation. Um, and we also have seen that, uh, you know, in, for example, in uh, um, some African countries, how this has helped. For example, in a key uh, um, driver of municipal revenue uh, um, in Kigali uh, is uh, estimated around $60 million a year, over four times of the city's current revenue. So there is huge potential in that area. And there are a number of countries that are listed here that have tried to look into this, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, issue of building capacity in terms of valuation and um, registry, enhancing the uh, uh, registration of land and property and enhancing compliance would be very important. Um, another area that is um, also would be important to uh, consider uh, is really utilizing uh, technology and uh, uh, um, e-government, for example, e-government services and e-government uh, uh, filing for taxes would be important. There has been already uh, work that has shown that it uh, it can help in enhancing revenue mobilization and in reducing corruption. So uh, utilizing this going forward would be important um, and it can help also in terms of streamlining um, procedures and uh, supporting, uh, in enhancing the uh, tax administration uh, capacity. Um, another uh, uh, another, of course, uh, issues would be issues of utilizing also um, other um, existing building on existing um, technologies, whether, um, you know, uh, a big data, um, uh, AI to enhance uh, 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 practices, whether it's in valuation, for example, but also it can help with issues, for example, like cross-border movements and detecting uh, evasion of taxation. So uh, we need to um, you know, kind of like bring up the the capacity of the um, uh, 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 revenue departments and tax administration departments to really keep up with the advances in these areas and to use it as an opportunity to enhance uh, compliance and detect evasion. Um, Another uh, area that perhaps before we move there, another area also um, that would be uh, uh, critical in terms of um, uh, enhancing the, the uh, potential for domestic um, resource mobilization uh, is really uh, um, um, tapping into this uh, uh, kind of enhancing the, the exchange with uh, other countries to avoid, for example, uh, some of the sources of the illicit financial flows, particularly in um, uh, trade misinvoicing. So that will would mean that, uh, and uh, uh, given that today, um, 
the uh, conferences held in Norway, countries, receiving countries uh, would need to collaborate with African countries to make sure to reduce these kind of uh, misinvoicing and evasion. And I think, you know, cross-country collaboration will be key to enhance that. But also there is another opportunity that is, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, came recently from the uh, global, uh, you know, corporate minimum tax that has been uh, agreed on, uh, and the, um, especially on uh, large and uh, uh, digital companies. Uh, and I think number, for example, Egypt has started to work working with partners to uh, streamline its uh, uh, regulation uh, with this uh, changes to be able to uh, achieve more revenues from uh, companies, for example, like Amazon, uh, Google, and so on. So I think we need to have more of harmonization of um, African countries' legislation to be able to uh, uh, reap the benefits of these global legislatory changes. Um, Another area that uh, uh, I think would be useful to uh, really um, uh, utilize is behavioral sciences. And uh, that can help in uh, tax compliance, uh, employing approaches to really enhance compliance. We have a huge literature on tackling uh, uh, compliance as nudging, whether uh, simplifying procedures, uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, change or tackle issues of social norms, um, creating economic games, incentives and rewards and penalties, personalized messaging, uh, using peer effects, trust building between government and taxpayers. All these things would really need to be uh, looked at and um, used more and some just to uh, African countries' credit, some countries have been starting to do that. Um, and here you have a number of uh, examples. For example, an experiment that was conducted in part partnership with uh, uh, Latvian Revenue Agency, uh, where informal economy uh, uh, loomed around 25% um, uh, yielded revealing insights. So we have already not only in Africa, but in other regions, we, we've seen that and we've seen the impact. Uh, also, uh, for example, uh, sending behaviorally informed messages for declaring omissions of tax declaration as a deliberate infraction uh, resulted in almost 10% higher compliance. Uh, also, uh, social norms messages uh, led to the most submissions uh, of 45 days after the deadline by over 5% increase. So perception of public benefits from compliance separately also affect tax compliance. And uh, there is a Norway study that reported increased compliance when the stated taxes are used for publicly financed services. And that takes me to um, a very important issue that I think one of the best ways to really enhance compliance is um, the communication and transparency on how the revenues from this collection is being used, meaning how this is affecting the uh, you know, normal life of citizens. Where is this money going for? Um, you know, what, what percent of this is going, for example, towards schools or hospitals or building roads um, or enhancing public transport? So I think that will really need to be done uh, a lot more and much better than what is currently is, because then this gives a sense of ownership for taxpayers about their money and what this money is going for. They're more likely to pay when they see results on the ground than if they believe that it's they're not benefiting from these uh, 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 costs to them, basically. Uh, I'd like to thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Over to you. Thank you very much for the keynote. Uh, we have actually 30 minutes or so for Q&A, and what I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yes, I can. What you can, I suggest is that we take three questions in a row, and Dr. Mossi can answer three questions in a row. We're going to try and mix questions from the online audience, 
and also from all of you here. Uh, first, let's start from all of you here, in, uh, here in, in the audience. If you could put your hand up, make sure the microphone reaches you. We have colleagues with microphones here. So do not speak before you get the microphone. And so if you put your hand up, I can see you, then I'll ask you to speak. So there's one there, I think, right? So let's just wait. One, two, and three there. OK. So let's start with this three. And speak loudly so that Dr. Mossing can hear you. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I hope you can hear me. My name is Christian von Haldenwang. I'm from the German Institute of Development and Sustainability. And I just wanted to um, emphasize the relevance of taking tax expenditures into account, as you did in your presentation. Um, five years ago, I think the same presentation would have not mentioned, or only in a side note, the key issue of tax expenditures, monies that are not collected by the governments due to, um, in order to provide incentives for investments or fight poverty and so on. And you said that there are some low-hanging fruits. I think that um, um, beyond that, um, it's highly relevant that the use of tax expenditures becomes more transparent. So reporting on tax expenditures and beyond that, evaluating the use of tax expenditures is key. And we are doing this work with the Global Tax Expenditures Database and with the Addis Tax Initiative, where we um, um, do workshops in, in Africa, Asia, and so on. And we see a lot of, um, a lot of goodwill on behalf of governments to engage in these kinds of reforms. But, and we also count with the support of UNECA on this, and I would really in, uh, encourage uh, UNECA to keep this work and to, um, to encourage governments to improve reporting and evaluation of tax expenditures. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very good question about the use of taxes, not just the mobilizing of taxes, and, and we'll come back to that. The most you can speak to that later on. So you had a question from that too? Um, Hand up so that the colleague can see you. Yep, and there's a question that happened on that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very good presentation, Doc, and uh, you've really covered a lot. My question is just in terms of uh, you highlighted strides and uh, how uh, taxing property and land can really help. In t Sorry, by the way, I'm uh, Arnold Chimfwembe from the Zambia Revenue Authority. Yeah. So my interest is in the taxation of uh, land and, uh, and property. You highlighted the challenges that are there in that field. So what is being done to help mitigate and what efforts probably are there to help countries that uh, could really benefit from this taxation on how they can go about with this? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, it's a very good question. There's a question from there. Yeah. Uh, good morning, this is Selim Rayhan from Bangladesh. Uh, excellent presentation. I think this is something what we are also from South Asia. We're also looking at this whole uh, tax, uh, low tax issues. Uh, some of the very uh, issues we, which you highlighted, very common to South Asian countries as well. My, I have very, uh, uh, I have two questions, very quick two questions. One is that you talked about uh, the land tax, especially drawing the lessons from uh, East Asia. Uh, but I have kind of concerns whether in African countries when land ownership in some, in many cases, are not properly defined. There are challenges. How do you really like to implement land tax in that context? And second, second question, you talked about high tax expenditure, uh, tax exemptions, avoidance, avoidance of tax uh, payment in many of the African countries. And these are very common in other, many other developing countries as well. But the problem there is not just only the technical solution like where you implement uh, or introduce many modern technologies, but the very inherent political economy dynamics within all these countries, especially the way the nexus between the business and the state the, in terms of avoidance of taxes, how do you like to reflect on, the, on this particular issue? Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Mossi, uh, you had three questions, actually four. Uh, do you want to answer them first and we get the next round of questions? Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you for um, all the participants for the engaging uh, questions and discussion. Uh, on the issue of reporting and transparency, I could not agree more with the uh, first participants on the need to actually encourage that. Um, I think that's also, uh, in a way, the role of citizens 
to ask for that transparency and to uh, uh, require it, you know, in terms of accountability from the government to ensure that this is actually uh, these uh, uh, tax benefits when they are given, uh, they are resulting or providing uh, benefits uh, uh, for, you know, economic development. Uh, in some cases, they could may perhaps, you know, create jobs, uh, lead to knowledge transfer, uh, uh, but we need to uh, be able to uh, kind of uh, know transparently what are, you know, when they are given, what is given, and then to be able to check and have evaluation and monitoring of how useful it has been and recalibrate accordingly if it has not provided uh, uh, um, you know, it has not delivered on what it's meant for to actually uh, scale it back uh, or eliminate it. Or perhaps even use a different policy tool to tackle the objective. So uh, completely agree. And I think this is an issue that uh, at um, uh, uh, the Economic Commission for Africa we've been working on. I would be happy to collaborate further uh, with others about uh, uh, then there, there was also an issue from uh, 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 that was raised uh, from the colleague in Zambia uh, regarding um, land taxation. I think when uh, there is a interest and political will, uh, you know, there can be a very specific steps in terms of how to go about implementing. Uh, some of the things that need to be also considered beforehand is uh, the uh, official registries, how much of the actually the property and the land is captured in official registries, because that will be, uh, you know, the first tool that you, the government would use in terms of administration and compliance. So one would need to work on that perhaps uh, uh, before, you know, the, the uh, uh, implementation or introduction of such tax. Uh, and also there are a variety. When we think of taxation, there is, uh, you can think of it as kind of a, uh, some sort of a form of uh, uh, wealth taxation in this, in, in, in this sense. So um, you can, you know, have a progressive way depending on, you know, the type of property, the cost, the size of the land and so on. Uh, that becomes more progressive so that you're not taxing the very small uh, and uh, low income uh, individuals. But also you could also use it to enhance economic efficiency. For example, um, there are uh, agricultural land that are not being used for agriculture or there are uh, in, you know, uh, land that is supposed to be in industrial areas that have not been built. So you could use also something to incentivize the, you know, the proper use of the prop, the uh, uh, land or the property uh, and to actually, uh, um, you know, tax kind of um, hoarding behavior. Um, and I think there will be, if there is interest in this, I'm sure there will be not only at ECA, but in number of uh, uh, development partners that would be happy to support Zambia if this is something that uh, there is interest and willingness to proceed with. Um, the uh, colleague from Bangladesh um, it raised a very important point, which is uh, issues of informal uh, land ownership. Uh, and uh, um, you're absolutely right that this is an issue that would be of concern because when you have informal uh, land tenure, uh, which happens in a number of African countries uh, where actually it's the land is being held under informal or, you know, uh, customary tenure systems, uh, this can, uh, um, you know, pose a challenge in terms of effective tax land administration. And uh, I think that's why I had mentioned earlier a very important step to actually introducing and implementing tax and land uh, 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 taxation is to ensure proper registries, perhaps work on enhancing that, uh, formalizing these type of arrangements ahead of time. Um, and also there is, um, you know, the, the um, 
tendency also there i mean if we look at it in more detail there tends to be also an urban ruler divide so um, you know in many times you find the more of the registered properties or lands in urban areas rather than in rural areas and you want to ensure um, that uh, 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 when when you are also taxing that you are not uh, with in taxing for example land you're not also um, a kind of uh, um, the balance or the weight of those taxation and how they fall in rural areas so these are some of the type of issues that policymakers will need to consider and really take it into account in terms of how such measures can be implemented um and there is the I, I was asked the the uh, kind of the challenging question about the the relation between business and state, and I think that's why I said in my in my intervention that this is not an easy route. It's um, a politically sensitive one, as in you know in Africa and all regions around the world. I'm sure also is the case in Bangladesh, uh, and it requires kind of like you know the. Uh, a, a lot of, um, you know, dialogues, a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, conversations, because it's it's part of a social contract. It's part of how the role of the state and what are the implications when, uh, you know, these actions, basically the cost of non-action is perhaps the type of things that we need to do more of. Um, it's not just we have the cost of these, for example, not having these resources, but what does this translate to in terms of how many of the poor and vulnerable, uh, you know, is this costing the, the, their, you know, for example, how many would be affected, can, can be uh, um, supported if these taxes are introduced? What are the trade-offs? Having these kind of uh, social and public conversations can only be you know, the way to pave the way to change and shift policies. Without them, um, it's it will be very difficult to just, you know, proceed with no engagement, with no understanding of what are the costs and benefits of all these uh, uh, different uh, uh, policy instruments. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mossi. I think we can take three more questions. I already saw a hand up there, right? Yeah, that's one there. A s online question, yeah, okay. And then one more question. So let's take this three and we'll come back again to the others. So one here, and then online question, uh, question online audience, and then question from Rose there at the back, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Alina Nasanga from Uganda Revenue Authority. I have two questions. One is on the land. In Africa, specifically in Uganda, there are people who own land that has been passed on to them from their grandparents. It's family land. For generations, they've owned this land. And um, what they are doing on this land mainly is growing food as subst substantial agriculture to feed themselves. I, I kept thinking, yes, it may be a good idea to tax these people, but aren't we pushing the poor of the poorest because um, they, are, they've, they didn't buy the land, they owned it from their grandparents and they grow food on it. They don't necessarily have um, any other source of income. So introducing a tax on this may it push them into um, a stage of even losing the only thing they have. How, um, in your case study, in your experience, how has this been handled elsewhere? The second is about um, the tax um, exemptions. Now, in Uganda, we have different institutions. We have uh, the investment authority that is um, um, out getting um, people for foreign direct investment into the country, then they get these exemptions, then we have the Minister of Finance, and then we have the URA. It is a good idea, yes, to have um, a proper monitoring and evaluation of these uh, tax exemptions to see their benefits. In your experience, um, who would be, which agency, how would uh, the monitoring and evaluation and reporting be handled? Should it be a role more in the Ministry of Finance or from the tax authority? Thank you so much. Thank you. There is a question from the online audience, so you can go there next. 
Thank you. This is a question from Ferdinand Philipson, who is following the session online. He asks, many development partners are highly supporting improvement of resource mobilization. At the same time, in their own countries, other forces, including ministries of economies, etc., are stimulating their companies to invest, invest in developing countries, requesting tax incentives. How can we reconcile this and align on country interest in development cooperation? Thank you. And then uh, uh, Rose Nungu give that back. And we'll come back again to the next set of questions. So, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for a very, very good uh, presentation. I have two questions. One, I like this aspect of uh, tax compliance and using the behavioral approach, uh, which you can convince uh, the taxpayers uh, uh, on why they need to, to pay tax. Um, and of course, uh, uh, that the tax is being used for, 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 pub, for provision of public service. But we have seen also uh, the other side of it. Uh, how do you hold the government accountable? Uh, how do you use the behavioral approach also uh, to ensure that uh, um, government is actually using the, f the, the monies that they are collecting uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, services. Is there an, a good example um, where, say, for example, blockchain, IE technology is being used by citizenry actually to uh, see to it that uh, the government is also being held uh, accountable in terms of how they are utilizing uh, the funding? Um, so that compliance is on both sides. I comply, I pay, you comply also, and uh, provide the, the services that are required. Uh, the second one is in terms of uh, progressive tax. We, all, we keep on talking about uh, uh, having a progressive uh, uh, tax system. But you can imagine uh, uh, you, are, you are taxing um, a person uh, income tax, so they pay, say, for example, 30%. And then uh, when they go to the grocery store to purchase goods, uh, they again pay uh, VAT because they, 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 they have uh, 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 to feed. If they go to do any uh, financial, taxation, uh, financial transaction, they again pay a tax on the same, same income that uh, they have. So. At what point do we say that there is progressive, our tax system is actually uh, uh, progressive? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we have very nice questions there. Dr. Mossi, did you want to answer them? Thank you, great questions. Um, thank you very much. Perhaps let me start, uh, um, you know, um, in reverse with the last question that was asked. Um, in terms of progressive taxation, um, you know, this is a, 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 a very it's, it's a very important issue. But let me let me perhaps give an example of as a uh, taxpayer have when uh, you know when I lived outside of Africa, where I was living, where I lived in the UK, I lived in the US. There is a property tax that you get each year, depending on the evaluation of the place that you're living in. And what you know is, you know, where these taxation, uh, these taxes are financing, you know, that these taxes finance the schools, the hospitals, and the roads in this neighborhood. And there is a tendency, basically, that, uh, you know, where you pay the higher taxes tend to be where the best schools are. And, uh, uh, you know, it creates more demand for these neighborhoods to actually have, you know, more citizens moving there or looking up for that area because, you know, that they are better funded, that they, have, they get better results, uh, and these are public schools. So these are the type of things that would make a difference or incentive for African citizens to be willing to do. They need to see what is this, you know, specific taxation is going to fund, how they are going to benefit. How does it make their neighborhood, their area more attractive, their life better um, for them and for their, ch for their children? So that would be 
uh, really important in considering um, how how to do that. Uh, and I know that uh, they. I mean, we've we've been talking about okay, we we are paying already, um, you know, income tax, uh, financial tax, VET. But let me just give you like you know. An example, I mean, we have, for example, I have mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, Namibia. Namibia uh, is a country that, a middle income country, uh, yet it has the second uh, highest inequality in Africa. And you have, for example, the land is concentrated in the, you know, with those that have the wealthiest. Um, and for, the government, for example, when a shock like COVID or like the war in Ukraine hits them, when they need to mobilize more resources for additional, um, you know, social safety nets, uh, what are the type of things that we need to ensure? Where are the resources? I think you would need to think about, okay, how is this land is being utilized? Is it being utilized for the reason that you know, uh, is stated, um, how is, how can perhaps this be, there, there be some sort of gradual taxation on it, uh, and also how this funding will be used. So I think, yes, there are taxation, but there are also things that when you see the realities and the specifics of the country, uh, you can define the appropriate solutions. Um, the question in terms of um, how do you make the government accountable behavioral wise? I think it's a very interesting area because most of the literature so far has focused more on the consumers rather than like, you know, incentivizing policymakers. I think we need to do more on that. And I do like your idea uh, of the blockchain to track. Um, but I think part of keeping governments accountable is the responsibility of the citizens, of the public to demand, uh, um, you know, that accountability, whether it's through, uh, you know, parliaments or Congress and, and to uh, ask for uh, uh, reporting on these issues to um, uh, really uh, um, enforce that through different mechanisms. For example, I mean, you, you've talked that, uh, 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 I can't remember the last speaker which country, but you talked about the issue of the tax exemptions, having a number of uh, government entities involved. So it's not concentrated in, in one entity. So it's important to have this even, you know, known and transparent. What are the kind of, you know, the, the checks and balances, what are the rules to give these tax exemptions, who have the right to do it, how it has been utilized for each of these entities, how much of these tax exemptions have been awarded, have been renewed, uh, have they been followed, uh, and to make sure that public has access to that. Um, in terms of who does the monitoring, I think this is really a kind of a, a, a national question that in some countries uh, you have a, a kind of like uh, independent entities like, for example, in Kenya, you have an independent entity that kind of looks at the tax uh, expenditures and uh, 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 not just expenditures in general, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, fiscal decisions and evaluate what has happened and it's independent from the government. But I think um, for each country, there can be like, you know, it can be decided within the country what would work best. The most important is in instilling that principle of accountability of regular evaluation and monitoring and transparency in sharing that that would be very important um the uh colleague from uh uganda um asked a, a, a very important uh question uh, regarding family-owned lands uh, that basically are used for subsistence and how this can have actually almost a, a negative impact, uh, perhaps can be even, uh, you know, regressive rather than progressive. 
Uh, that's why we had, when we were talking earlier, I talked about valuation. So um, in, when, when uh, these valuations are done properly, it will also take into account, you know, the uh, not only the value of the land, but also it can take, take into account in terms of the um, region, the regions that this is be, uh, are are done. The the kind of the um, areas, you know, the, the 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 poverty in different areas. So this is not just a one size fits all. There need to be a, a really kind of a very a thorough process in terms of determining how to go about it. Uh, it's not the idea is not just taxing like you know uh, land regardless, but it's basically taxing to reflect the valuation they use uh, and also the capacity of those that are that own it actually to to pay. So um, it's not intended, for example, to be uh, um, you know for the subsistence farming uh, uh, land. It's more intended to be for the more, uh, um, you know, expensive land or lands that are used are not used for what they are supposed to be for, say, agriculture used for something else or industrial areas, but they are not built. All these things can uh, can be a, a very important consideration to take into account. Um, I if if you could please repeat the question for the online question because I didn't capture that. Many development partners are highly supportive improvement of resource mobilization. At the same time, in their own countries, other forces, including ministries of economies, etc., are stimulating their companies to invest in developing countries requesting tax incentives. The question is, how can we reconcile this and align own country interest in development cooperation? Uh, we have to have... <laughs> We have to have that. Yeah, yeah, I, I did hear it. Thank you. Uh, we have to have these tough conversations. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, this needs to be part of the conversation. It doesn't doesn't mean that. Uh, I mean, it's great for develop, uh, developed countries to give incentives for private sector to come to the continent, but uh, we need to doing having this evidence. Uh, uh, you know, uh, evidence-based assessment on what helps, what doesn't help, uh, how this has helped before, what other policy instruments would be more relevant to these investors would be the type of conversations we want to have and we want to come to them very well prepared. So we cannot just take like, you know, uh, for granted that if these investors need to come, they need to have tax breaks because, I mean, uh, you can give them the tax break and they can leave in a couple of years, uh, not, you know, creating much impact. So uh, uh, it's about really having a, 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 a thorough assessment of what needs to be done, what would be more attractive and more important for these uh, um, uh, foreign companies to come to the continent and working also with the uh, uh, these donor countries on how you know to support perhaps even what would be even more useful is uh, uh, providing you know uh, um, a, a affordable uh, 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 financing to uh, to you know uh, uh, these foreign companies to come and uh, 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 have um, production facilities. Uh, perhaps it's you know having uh, uh, ensuring better uh, energy supply, uh, better roads, uh, uh, ability to expatriate uh, profits. So it's it's a conversation that has to be wider than just this one issue uh, uh, to get deeper impact for the continent. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I can see more than one hand. Well, I, I think we're almost getting close to the to 10.30. So let's take two short questions. I'm sorry, I know others have wanted to ask questions, but we are running out of time. There's one question I know that the lady there was very keen to ask. It. So you can go ahead, and then there's a question somewhere here, I thought. Um, yeah, okay, so let's take the question first. Thank go you. ahead, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for the good presentation. My name is Karen Kandie from the National Treasury of uh, 
Republic of Kenya. Uh, my two questions, one, uh, just some emphasis uh, that uh, a lot of uh, FDIs, foreign direct investments, come with a kind of a carrot and stick. Uh, you know, we want to invest uh, 10 million of these, but we need these tax incentives. It's almost um, a known narrative that uh, with the promise of investing, they want a tax exemption. How do we have this conversation so that it doesn't look present uh, for you as an investor to come and ask for tax exemption in an African country, knowing that it's a carrot and stick issue uh, because we need uh, jobs. So, and we need that foreign direct investment. So we, we tend to have our doors open because we've got to create jobs for our many youth that are not employed. Uh, but we need the other side also to have the goodwill of knowing that uh, paying tax is part of the narrative because you need the port, you need the airline to ship your goods. I mean, you need all the infrastructure that we have to build with the taxes. So it shouldn't look a pleasant thing uh, for you to ask for the taxes. And uh, in some cases when there is a tax uh, break, let's say a 10 years tax break, then you find after the 10 years the investor changes, either leaves or changes the names to a different name and re-registers another company that negotiates for, for tax breaks. So it's not a present thing. Then the other issue that you did mention was uh, on property taxes. There is scope for that. Uh, just to give you, um, on the ground, 70% of the population, for instance, in Kenya lives in the rural areas. And I believe even for the other African countries, it is close to that percentage. And in the rural areas, we have a freehold land, uh, as opposed to leasehold. Now, freehold land, we don't tax. Leasehold land, which is in the urban areas, we tax. However, even if in the urban areas, 70% of the urban population lives in the slums. And that means that uh, that is land which is not titled, and probably nobody even knows who owns that land, because people have simply uh, been building the shanties you know, with time. Nobody, uh, most of it, nobody knows who owns it. So we have a very small percentage that is actually taxable. Nevertheless, there is scope to have the system streamlined uh, so that it is known uh, this title, uh, it's owned by so-and-so, and this is the, the, the sizing, which is what Kenya has been doing, digitalizing the, the, the land titles. And then I, I believe uh, once this is fi we finish this digitalizing, we should be able to invoice uh, the landowners. Because previously what would happen is people would only pay the land rates and, tax and taxes when they need to transfer the land. Because you can't transfer the land with arrears. Can we, uh, I'm sorry, but we are quite short, but we're running out of time. Yes, so uh, we, I think, I think got, those are yeah, my two yeah, questions. Thanks, yeah. Thank you very much. And so very quick question from you. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you. My name is Magnus Eriksson. I'm a mineral economist and mineral policy advisor. At present, there, the green energy transition increases demand for minerals and metals of which Africa has plenty. At the same time, you mentioned that tax exemptions in mining is quite common. You mentioned 48 countries. So my question is, are there any plans or ideas how to improve and optimize taxation of mining and minerals in Africa in this present window of opportunity? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mossi, two minutes for the response. You already passed that. So if you don't mind, the, I think the first question is really about these two issues. One is about the trade-off, uh, removing incentives for FDI, and whether that will lead to a situation of FDI not coming into Africa, not getting jobs. And the second is question of whether there is actually property out there that can be taxed at all. I mean, if most of the, of the land is either informally held and so on. The second is about the mining question that came up. So quick quick responses, thank you very much. Sure. Um, the FDI conditional, I think the conversation would also need to be, okay, perhaps how many jobs do you have a threshold? If they're creating X thousand of jobs, you could consider that, you know, they get the tax break and for uh, upfront time limit, and perhaps then even be evaluated afterwards whether to be these incentives to be continued or not. So uh, it can also be so. So you can condition it from a country perspective on 
how many jobs locally they are creating, how many thousands of jobs, uh, how many, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 locals are they training in terms of knowledge transfer. So you can also make it uh, conditional and accountable for these companies whenever they get these incentives, that it's conditional on specific criteria, and you can track that whether or not to be renewed, perhaps annually, every two years, uh, but it need, that needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, in terms of the property uh, and the, the fact that many of them are, uh, most of the land would be, for example, in slums or areas where low income and poverty is concentrated, um, you know, part of the property tax in many countries would have a minimum valuation to, uh, above which uh, these start to apply. So that's why this issue of valuation is very important. Once this is done, you can actually have, uh, you know, a kind of a floor uh, um, for which above which this this property taxation start to kick in. And in many countries that apply property tax, that actually the way. So there is a, a minimum valuation that is, you know, kind of exemption is, is does not is not covered, and above which there is kind of gradual taxation. Um, and of course, the the uh, digitalizing and making sure that there are a registration for these lands would be critical. Uh, in terms of the last one on the mining, uh, I think this is uh, um, an area that needs to be looked into more. But I think um, the idea of just Africa uh, exporting raw material is just Africa exporting development opportunities. So there needs to be beyond just the mining itself, what else like, you know, is done. It cannot just, you know, be exporting raw material. There needs to be a value addition, uh, you know, around these raw materials. So that actually provides opportunities for economic development. But um, I think this is an area, and I know this is not an easy area, but an area that really looked to be, need to be looked into in a lot more detail. Uh, and uh, strategically, in, in terms of looking forward, how do we reshift our development model? And thank you, Dr. Mosi. It's an important uh, point to end at that tax or domestic revenue should be seen in a broader context to understand the development process of, of low income countries, especially Africa. And it's not just, it's not just about mobilizing re revenue, but looking at the overall development trajectory of countries that are in the low income and middle income space. That's a really important point to keep in mind when we discuss all the different th areas, themes we're gonna listen to in the next two and a half days. Dr. Mosi, thank you so much. I know you are very, have been very busy with the Africa Climate Summit. Thank you for so generously giving your time to us this morning. And, and I hope that you know, we'll be obviously um, you know, working with you in ECHA, in Ibaja, and uh, to work, think about different issues that you've raised in this you know, lecture, which are really very important. Thank you so much.